Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the webinar for our MSc in Major Program Management. My name is Tom Brownrigg and I am the recruitment manager for the program. I, I'm here with Dr. Atif Ansar, who is the program director. Atif is going to go through a presentation for us which should provide you with a good taster of the content of the MSc in Major Programs. Then we're going to have some time at the end for questions. So welcome Atif and if you'd like to take it away. Thank you very much Tom. Good afternoon everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you. My name is Atif Ansar. I'm going to first of all tell a little bit about myself and then take you through some of the research we've been doing on me major programs and, and mega projects um, at the University of Oxford. Um, a bit about myself. I've been at Oxford for nearly 10 years. Um, and uh, sorry, this is how do I? Um, and I did my PhD in Oxford, what we call a DPhil. I, I then became a postdoctoral fellow at the Said Business School and faculty uh, since 2010. Uh, my role here as a as a program director of the MSc is really uh, to be a resource, as a faculty resource available to all the students. Um, you see quite a bit of me. I teach on the program. Um, as well as direct various elements, um, including um, uh, part of the recruitment process. I'm also the court manager of the UK government's Major Projects Leadership Academy. It's in many ways a spin out from the MSc program, which started nearly eight years ago, um, and that's in recognition of the great work we've been doing in Oxford in creating a community of practice of major program leaders. My research expertise is in major programs and specifically in infrastructure. Um, and I do quite a bit of consulting work based on that experience. Uh, but making sense of my research over the last 10 odd years, um, what I'm really interested in are social ideals and their fate uh, when they meet reality. And one thing we've learned over and over again in our research is that reality is a very unkind place to ideals. Um, and major programs are often an emblem of those ideals. Um, so what we try to teach our students is how to maintain that their ambition um, and to think broader and bigger but not to be naive about what the world is going to do to those ideas once they actually start implementing them and that combination um, of thinking big uh, but working hard um, is at heart of the degree so i hope some of you will would find that of interest um, and, and and come and join us Research on dams. By the way, this is Oxford on a resplendent day, and this is what it looks like uh, typically, but it's good fun and very beautiful nonetheless, uh, despite the frequent rainfall. Um, so what I'm going to do with, with respect to dams is I'm going to make a few observations about uh, mega dams, um, and then I'm going to offer you a few interpretations uh, of why we observe the, the various challenges that we do. Um, and then if, if we've got enough time available, we might look at a couple of solutions. Um, the reason why we studied dams is simply because they are in many ways an archetypical mega project. Um, everybody's seen one, people are inspired by them, um, and it's one of those things that we were interested in understanding of how, um, how do they perform um, in the real world. And I'm going to give you a very quick stylized um, case study please type in your responses to the question I'm about to ask you. So here is the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Put yourselves in the shoes of Mr. Nawaz Sharif. Pakistan is a country of great many hydropower resources. Uh, it also suffers from tremendous floods every few years because of its many rivers. And paradoxically, it's got a very severe energy shortfall. What do you reckon the Prime Minister ought to do to overcome the twin challenge of flooding and hydropower shortfall. I'll take a second to wait for your typed in responses. Well, as is typical, many of you are already suggesting that the country ought to build large dams. Now, these two things seem to go together uh, really well. Um, countries with, with hydropower potential like Pakistan, Brazil, China, um, Bhutan, you name it, uh, tend to also have flooding problems and electricity shortfall problems. But let's see whether building these mega dams would be easy. 
And one thing that we frequently confront is that dams are thought to be a standardized technology. We've been building dams as human beings for 5,000 years. Even beavers are able to make dams. The idea is common that dams are widely studied engineering problem and as such should not really be caused much of an issue in getting built. Uh, dams also have a very interesting property and that's where they become interesting from a theorizing perspective that a large proportion of their costs are incurred up front. So we can see what sunk costs that are almost entirely up front due to the, to the dam's uh, viability uh, because there's not much by way of variable costs unlike say a thermal uh, power plant which will burn feedstock. Um, so let's look at some of the data. We collected data on 269 projects worth $370 billion from 1934 to 2007. It is the largest and most valid and reliable data set of its kind ever constructed. The previously large data set was by World Commission of Dams, which is one of our sources, which had just over 100 projects in its data set. Uh, and we've nearly tripled uh, the size of that data set. What this slide, slide 7, also shows is this very representative sample covering variety of locations, dam sizes, and project vintages. So we're able to make relatively broad representative uh, inferences about what this data is to show. Um, now, let's look at the first measure that we're interested in, which is the overrun on the estimated cost. This is the cost um, that the planners had uh, before making the final decision to build. So this is not at the tender stage, uh, but at the stage in which the, the planners committed themselves. And at this point, some form of a cost-benefit analysis is done to determine whether the alternative of the big dam um, is a viable one or not. What this shows, what this very skewed distribution on slide 8 shows, is that dams have a very, very large cost overrun, on average of plus 90%. They also have a long tail, so uh, actually cost more than double for uh, nearly 20% of the dams and triple for one out of every 10 dams. Um, and the frequency of cost overrun far outweighs the frequency of it coming under budget or on budget. What this suggests is that the cost, costs are being underestimated uh, on the basis of which the decisions to build these dams are being, being made. As a result, other alternatives that may then appear a little bit more expensive, but would suffer fewer cost overruns or uh, less frequency and less magnitude are ignored. And that's a big decision making problem. Uh, it's also a global phenomenon. What we see on slide nine is that the United States and Canada have a better performance in the building of dams in terms of cost overruns, um, but um, the rest of the world suffers far, far greater cost overruns. Um, and the reasons for this uh, are simply that building dams is very difficult. In the US, a lot of the dams that we looked at were New Deal dams built during a recession. Um, so there was generally um, you know, lower pressure on prices um, than elsewhere. Moreover, in the US, a lot of the inputs are sourced in US dollar terms, which is not a luxury that other countries have. So for example, and I'll come to this later, a dam being built in India, for example, has to pay for a lot of the inputs in Indian rupees. Any depreciation in the currency comes up as a cost overrun and nearly half the dam is imported. And I'll come back to this important point in a second. A second challenge faced by dams is that they also overrun their schedule. Um, this is a problem simply because there's a mismatch between when users need certain services and when they become available. So the case of the example of Pakistan um, a dam that's built in nearly 10 years is simply not good enough to protect the, the farmers now against floods that would uh, happen several times during that time period. Similarly, if there's a schedule overrun, that time period is further extended. Um, for those of you familiar with finance, you'd also recognize that a schedule overrun also reduces the net present value of the project because it pushes the benefits farther back, which means that they lose um, their, their time value. Um, so essentially the alternatives that are quicker are far preferable from a value perspective. Um, finally, uh, schedule overruns also cause debt uh, overhang problems, uh, which I'll very briefly talk about um, shortly as well. 
Um, and a final challenge for which we haven't collected as much data as we'd like is because there's simply none available uh, or very, uh, very little data is available uh, is on benefit shortfall. So here I'm giving you a case study of the Kenji and Jebba hydropower dams uh, in Nigeria. And when the appraisal uh, report was done for this project by the World Bank, they assumed that the river flow was going to be very regular, which was going to make it very easy to predict the electricity production. In reality, um, the, the uh, rivers have experienced um, either flood or uh, absolute drought, and the overall benefit shortfall has been almost 75%. Um, so nearly three quarters of the capacity stays idle. Um, a dam simply cannot pay itself. Any mega project that is idle for 75% of its time cannot pay itself back. There's an also another important point in this basic asymmetry. Um, a big flood doesn't allow a dam to produce more electricity than it's, uh, it's designed for, whereas a drought causes it to produce almost no electricity. So there's a fundamental asymmetry where the benefits are, have a very firm ceiling, where, but the benefit shortfall can essentially be, uh, be almost infinite or go up to, um, to 0%. Um, whereas with costs, as we saw early on um, on slide eight, costs can keep escalating. So in this case, the largest cost uh, overrun is over 5,000%. That fundamental asymmetry is what we call fragility, um, where things that are going against you really have no limit, but things that are going in your favor are truncated. Um, and I'll develop this with, with a few examples. So let's turn to a few case studies and, and create a few interpretations for why we're observing these adverse outcomes. And the basic idea I'm going to put forward is, although there are multiple reasons for why this happens, part of this is simply our human inability and the inability of policymakers and planners to um, work with time, the fog of time. Um, and as Harold Macmillan famously said, it's events, dear boy and girls, events. Um, and a huge number of them happen. And think of time, uh, which a colleague of mine, Ben Flyberg, and I often say, is simply like a window through which black swans can fly in, i.e. a window of opportunity through which adverse events can fly in. The bigger the window, the more disasters can happen. And the case of dams, a huge number of things happen from site-specific geological risks to exchange rate volatility to inflation to uncertainty about um, water uh, movements, demographic change, strikes, wars, et cetera, et cetera. Let's look at a few examples. In Chivo Dam in Colombia, the appraisal document assumed that the exchange rate of the Colombian peso against the US dollar was going to be very stable because the government had been pursuing quote unquote enlightened policies. However, um, reality proved to be no such thing. And uh, the exchange rate declined nearly 90% or over 90%, um, causing a 35% cost overrun in real terms. By the way, all the cost overrun numbers that I've quoted are in real terms. What this means is that we have removed the effects of inflation. Um, in the real world, uh, people pay debt on actual inflation that, that is included. So actually, these numbers are highly conservative, um, and in reality, um, uh, the, the numbers are far larger. So if, if I did a similar case for Argentina, where the Argentinian peso declined so much, this number would be absolutely huge, and which goes some way to explain uh, the many recurrent financial crises that countries like Ar Argentina have faced through their uh, life. The second example is about site-specific geological risks for a site in Brazil, uh, in uh, Itumbiara, and where um, the cost estimates provided quite a large contingency of 20% uh, for any weak rock uh, in which the dam's piles were going to be put in. Um, but once they start digging, they realize that they had to just keep digging, and the weak geology ended up costing and nearly doubling uh, the, the base cost in real terms. Another example is from Tabela Dam in Pakistan, close to home for me, where I grew up. Um, and there, a general contingency of 7.5% had been added by the World Bank's uh, um, uh, uh, staff who were doing the appraisal. In reality, inflation uh, bid 380% uh, 
um, and escalated the costs of the project. Um, and that had a big effect on the overall debt levels of the country, uh, which is shown in slide 17, where just the one dam uh, accounted for a near 23% increase in the debt of the country. So no matter how you look at it, countries like Pakistan that built these mega projects are still servicing the debt accumulated to pay for these mega assets. Uh, and Pakistan is not unique. I'll put another example of Colombia, but I could give you uh, uh, hundreds of examples from Yugoslavia and Turkey, Brazil, Mexico, any country that's really experienced a financial um, sovereign debt crisis um, is preceded, the episode is preceded by uh, investments in poor, uh, poor mega projects. So the net result of this is the typical benefit to cost ratio of, of these dams is 1.4. What this means is that the planners expect uh, the, the net present value of the benefits to exceed the costs by nearly 40%. But once you account for average cost overruns of 90 plus percent um, and over two and a half years of delay, nearly half the dams that we studied simply cannot pay back for themselves. So there are serious problems in capital recovery. Um, and that capital recovery is a symptom of a larger problem in which poor social policy decisions are made, um, which results in, uh, in net lower welfare um, for the countries and communities for which these major programs are built. Um, the net result is also that after the project's been built, not only is it difficult to recover the costs sunk into it, but it creates a big mess behind it. So the Three Gorges Dam in China was very, very expensive to build in the first place with a big cost overrun. However, since then, another $26 billion need to be spent in the next 10 years to rectify all the environmental havoc the dams caused and is causing uh, for very unpredictable reasons um, around it. Um, the same is true, this is not a dam, but for the Fukushima nuclear reactor in Japan, where the costs uh, after the reactor had a meltdown are, are nearly $13 billion. Um, so it's just simply not finite, it's an infinite pit um, in terms of the overall mess this creates. Um, one point I ought to mention is nobody really knows the costs of decommissioning big projects like nuclear power plants. Similarly, nobody really knows the costs of, of, of removing large dams. Uh, when these dams, like the Hoover Dam, were built, uh, the notion was that these dams and these major programs would effectively be infinite in their lifespan. That notion is proving to be incorrect. Um, and the cost of removal seems to be even higher than cost of putting the junk in the first place. Um, and this is an area to watch in terms of accruing financial liabilities. To conclude the interpretations, uh, on slide 21, I'm going to give you a parable borrowed from Nassim Taleb's book called Anti-Fragility. And the idea here is that a, uh, a king, an, in a moment of uh, imprudence, uh, angry at his crown prince, says to him, I'm going to crush you under the weight of a very large stone. And once the king sobers up, he realizes that he can't afford to lose his crown prince, besides the fact that he loves him a great deal. So he calls up a sage from the University of Oxford, the greatest university in the land, and asks the sage, Herr Doctor, can you please uh, help us um, uh, in, in this problem and save the life of my son? Um, and the professor responds, um, crush the weight of the stone in small pebbles and hit your son one by one. And you would have kept your word of crushing him under the weight of the stone without losing the life of your son. The basic message here is as follows. Um, mega projects, as they get larger in their size, um, essentially have the ability to sink companies and countries in which they're built, a bit like a very large stone falling on a, on a crown print. Um, so one thing that you ought to do um, in your organizations is to establish a threshold beyond which uh, the size of a project you ought not attempt. Um, and coming close to it is will be foolhardy. The second message here is that if you want to do something, think about incrementalizing it into smaller pebbles. Um, lots of small pebbles would add up to the stone, so you can still get the same effect, um, but um, the overall risk that you face in your organizations and in your personal careers um, would be far diminished. Um, and this leads me to the final 
uh, point of the presentation, which is to talk about a few interventions we could make um, to to improve the generalizable problem of of Mega Dam, and whereas uh, and and major pro programs in general, um, we cover this in considerable depth um, within the MSc program on major program management. So I'm just going to offer you one outline of one solution, and that is the idea of put it in a box. Uh, the notion being that instead of attempting very, very large ma major programs, think carefully about modularizing um, what you're trying to do, um, a bit like the way the uh, shipping container modularized shipping. On slide 25, I'm showing you two pictures of how bulk, bulk, bulk cargo shipments used to take place in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and as you can see, it was a highly manual process and a very messy process. Um, this was not scalable, even though some of these ships were very big. So the point here is scale does not equate with scalability. Uh, and often people confuse the two. Um, whereas, and again on slide 26, more evidence of, of the sheer manual involvement in, uh, in, in the shipping process. But on slide 27, you can look at one of the largest ships in the world, container ships in the world now, called Merce Liner. It is in fact so large, as you can see, the blue whale um, w in the bottom of the of the slide appears uh, like a tiny midget in comparison to the ship. These ships are essentially s floating cities. And the amount of time it takes to put all those containers on a MERS ship is between 12 hours to 18 hours. So imagine how much they've reduced that time window in which risks can take place from 8.2 years for large dams to 12 to 18 hours um, to get something that's comparably uh, equally large in terms of its size. Um, and this, I would suggest, is far scalable as the final slide in tw slide 28 shows. Um, since container shippings have come uh, um, uh, around in the 50s and 60s, world trade has absolutely boomed. Um, and um, on the top of the slide, you can see these are trillions of dollars, so $20 trillion of trade, despite glo uh, global um, sort of recession problems at the moment, that's being traded, a huge amount of it on uh, uh, shipping, uh, shipping lines, uh, in, on containers, and the costs have declined. They're almost approximate zero for each ton, uh, each ton of um, um, shipping weight um, moved. So the point here is, this sort of containerization has not happened in the energy and the electricity space. And we have to think very carefully about how we can modularize um, some of these other um, uh, industries, such as electricity, water. Um, it's happened to some degree in telecom, uh, but not elsewhere. I'm going to pass back on to Tom, and I look forward to your questions in a minute. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Atif. Um, that was extremely insightful. And, and hopefully, if you're considering the MSc and major program management, um, that gives you a good idea of some of the issues that we're tackling as part of the program and some of the research that's being produced by the school. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of quick slides on the admissions process and some ideas on the content of the program and who it's designed for. So some key facts. So the MSc in Major Program Management is focused on senior managers who are leading large-scale mega projects and transformational uh, major programs. So it's really focused on seasoned um, major program managers and people who have good exposure in mega projects. So it's delivered in eight modules, um, which each consist of four days across two years. Um, so you'll be in the campus from Tuesday through to Friday for the duration of the program and there's about a two month gap in between each of the modules. You'll have the chance to produce a meaningful piece of research um, in the form of a 10,000 word dissertation. So this project will give you a chance to really apply some of the concepts that you'll be picking up during the program into your day-to-day -day roles and you'll be looking to bounce ideas off the fellow participants and uh, contribute to a group learning um, experience. And as I mentioned at the top, this program is really focused on major program management. So we believe it's unique 
in higher education, we're looking at not just normal projects, but mega projects which are taking place globally today. So just a bit of information on the typical class profile. So to give you an idea of the diversity of the class, um, so we have candidates coming from a variety of different sectors um, and different industries. And we're looking to bring a group of 50 to 60 people together to share experiences and, and talk about the challenges that they're currently facing. Um, we have candidates who are aging from 29, 30, all the way into their 60s. So the minimum requirement of experience is seven, seven years of relevant experience. But on average, to give you an idea, we have candidates who have around 15 years experience and above. So we have diversity in sectors, but also in nationality. So we have candidates coming from across the world. Um, Atif mentioned um, talking about mega dams, some of the various different mega projects which have taken place across Africa, Latin America and the Far East. Um, and we're looking to bring in more examples through our candidates um, and talk about issues that are going on globally. So your investment, um, so the programme fee is £36,434 for this intake. Um, so a bit of information there including um, what's involved as part of that fee. So you have college membership, um, you have participation in the, in the modules and the majority of the learning resources. In terms of time, your commitment, so you're required to attend each of the eight modules which take place across the two years. You're, you're required to prepare module um, pre-reading as well as assignments for each of the modules. So that's very important and something that we're really focused on here at Oxford is that each of the modules is examined and assessed. Then we give a guideline when you're not here for the modules um, that normally you'll have to commit around 10 hours study time per week. In terms of admissions, um, so we judge each application on a case-by-case -case basis, but as a guideline, um, you'll be required to have a strong undergraduate degree from a reputable uh, institution, as well as um, potentially or in Instead, you could have a, an equivalent professional qualification or accreditation. We'll normally look for a minimum of seven years relevant professional experience with significant exposure to mega projects and major programmes. Um, but as I mentioned, on average, our candidates normally have around 15 to 20 years experience. If English is not your native language, um, then you may be able to, you, you may be required to take an English test in IELTS or TOEFL. Um, but we also do have a process for an English waiver. So if you use English as your professional language or you've spent a significant amount of time in an English speaking country, then you can discuss that with me and we can potentially set up an English waiver. So in terms of application, so the application is done online, um, so you can find the link on our website. Um, you'll be required to submit an up-to-date CV, two professional references who can comment on how you have had exposure to major projects, um, transcripts of your previous higher education qualifications, so your degree transcripts, as well as your certificates. Um, and then you'll be given three assignments to complete as part of the application. If you succeed with those assignments, then you will be invited to an interview with our admissions committee, which will normally take place online. Well, thank you very much, Atif. Um, I think that concludes our webinar. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, it's been really, really insightful, and I hope if you're considering the program, um, then this has been useful and informative for you. Um, if you would like to discuss the, the, the course and the study experience here at Oxford with us further, then please get in touch. Um, so I'm going to leave my contact details and I will also be in touch with you all um, after the presentation. Um, and a special thank you to Dr. Atif Ansar as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the presentation.
been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.